What's up guys, it's Sean here. Welcome back to another episode of The Computer Scientist. Today we're going to build a neural network to classify images of handwritten digits. So essentially we would feed it an image of a digit and it would tell us which digit it was. To train and test our model, we're gonna need a dataset of labeled images of digits. So we're gonna use the MNIST dataset, which is the largest dataset containing 60,000 images of handwritten digits and their corresponding labels which was created for testing out different machine learning classifiers. The MNIST dataset is openly available online, but we can actually access it from the TensorFlow library in our Python notebook. Now we can actually get an instant Python notebook online by searching Google Colab and clicking on this link. This is essentially like the Google Drive version of Jupyter Notebook and it comes pre-installed with TensorFlow, which we will import along with the other essentials. We'll also set the NumPy print options to print to a line width of 150 characters for printing large arrays. And we'll also print the current TensorFlow version. So now we can save the MNIST dataset object from the tf.keras.datasets.mnist module and then unpack the training and testing data that we get from calling the load data function. And if you're curious about how I know this, it's from the TensorFlow tutorials page which you can get to by searching for TensorFlow and clicking on this link. Now let's figure out what's what in our data by looking at the dimensions. So just looking at the training set, if we print the shape of the input and the output, we can see that our input contains 60,000 samples of 28 by 28 matrices and our output is just 60,000 values. Then if we print the first output and input pair, it seems like the output Y is the class number for the digit and the input X is the pixel brightness values of the image of the digit. We can also show the input as a grayscale image like so. Okay, so now that we know our data, let's figure out how to design our neural network. Recall that a neural network will take in a vector of input values and output a vector of specified output size. We know that the image is clearly the input but how do we turn that into a series of input values? Well, we could consider each pixel's brightness value to be a unique independent variable. This would then give us 28 times 28, which equals 784 input values for each image. Now there's just the task of converting the 2D matrix into a 1D vector. Well, we can just take each pixel value from left to right, row by row, from the first row to the last, as though we were reading a paragraph from a book. So now that we have our input as a vector of 784 values, we then want to get an output that tells us what class category the input image belongs to. This is best done by outputting a probability value for each class, which represents the probability that the image is from that class. So since we have 10 digit classes from 0 to 9, we want to output a vector of length 10, where ideally the index of the matching class has a probability of 1, and the rest have a probability of zero. This is known as a one-hot encoded output, which in our case is a vector of 10 values. So continuing on, we first convert our series of 2D images into a series of 1D vectors of 784 elements long, using NumPy's reshape function and passing in the new shape. Here we have negative one in the first dimension to let NumPy figure out that dimension size. Then we need to convert our direct class values from our output into one-hot encoded vectors. Turns out TensorFlow has a function for one-hot encoding, which also requires us to specify the number of classes as the depth. But remember we need to run this in a TensorFlow session to compute the output of the function and save it in our variables. So now if we print the first label for the digit 5, we have the one-hot encoded vector having a 1 in the index for the class 5. Finally, let's just print each input and output shape to verify that we have the right shape. Okay, now for defining our network architecture. I'm gonna go through two network approaches. Number one, the basic single-layered neural network approach, and number two, using a multi-layered neural network. So for the single-layer approach, we get our raw outputs by matrix multiplying the input with a weight matrix, which has the number of rows matching the number of inputs and number of columns matching the number of outputs, and then we add the bias vector, which has the resulting shape. So presenting this as a network graph, we multiply the input x with the weight matrix w, and then add the bias b to get the raw outputs known as logits. Then to get the predicted probabilities for each class, 
we pass the logits to the softmax function which scales each output in the range of 0 to 1. Finally, to define the error function to be minimized, we need to use the cross entropy equation given as E equals the sum of the negative log of the probabilities times the target label and we can just extend our graph from the probabilities to reach this loss value. If you're not too familiar with the softmax function or cross entropy loss, my binary classification video explains how those work. I'll link that in the description as well. So now for defining our network, we start off by declaring our input and target placeholders for us to pass in the data to the graph during training. We will set the first dimension value to none to allow for any number of rows of data. Then we create our weight and bias as tensorflow variables with the weight matrix as small random values and the bias as a zero vector. Then our logits are the result of the matmul function to matrix multiply the input with the weights and adding the bias to it. Our predicted probabilities are then the output of the softmax of the logits. So for the loss, we will define our error as the negative log of the probabilities multiplied by the one hot labels and then our loss is just the sum of these over all the classes and across the batch. We should also limit the minimum probability value so that we don't take the log of 0. Let's make 0 0.001 as the minimum. So actually TensorFlow has its own function for calculating the cross entropy of the softmax of the logits and the target labels directly. So I'll move our loss calculation into a function to give you an idea of what TensorFlow's function is doing. Finally, we create our training step from one of TensorFlow's optimizers, which we will use to minimize the loss. Now let's get to training. So within a TensorFlow session, and after initializing the global variables, we will loop for 10 iterations and run the training step to train the model. But we also need a way of evaluating how well the model is doing after each iteration. So what we can do is calculate an estimate of the accuracy as the proportion of correctly predicted samples from the batch. Now we can identify the predicted class as the index of the highest probability and we can get this using the argmax function over the columns axis. We can then get a list of true or false values for whether each sample was correctly predicted where the predicted class equals the target class and then we can sum these up to get the average accuracy out of 1. We also need to cast the correct preds from boolean to float otherwise tensorflow will throw an error. Now we can calculate the accuracy by running the accuracy operation, this time using the test images and labels, so that we can get an unbiased estimate of how well our model works on unseen data. So then let's just print the accuracy for each iteration. Okay, now we're ready to start training the model. But it looks like our accuracy is improving, so there's probably something that we're missing. So if you take a closer look at our dataset, we have a total of 60,000 samples that we're training on at once. And also since our starting weights are just random values, our untrained model is going to have huge losses, and especially big losses accumulated over all 60,000 samples. So this is likely to cause the weights to explode to very large numbers and corrupt the model during training. So to fix this, we will train the model incrementally over small batches of samples, and for image classification, usually between 50 and 250 samples in each batch is suitable. So let's just go with 250. Then we will adjust the train step to run in a for loop of starting indices for each batch, starting from 0 to the total number of samples, and in increments of the batch size for each iteration. And we'll define batch data variables as slices from the main data and pass these into the feed dictionary. But if we try training it again, we still see that the accuracy isn't improving by much. Well, if we take a closer look at our input values, we see that they can range up to 255, which can sum up to very large numbers, especially when you have 784 of them. So we will try normalizing our inputs as floats in the range of 0 to 1 by dividing them by 255. And this time when we train it, it works and we can see a final accuracy of 92%. So we were able to get a best accuracy of 92%, but can we do better? Let's now look at the second approach using the multi-layered neural network. So what we're going to do here is direct the outputs of our current model as inputs to a second neural network, which will be the new final output for our predictions. This entire thing can be treated as one neural network, where the intermediate output is also known as a hidden layer of the network. You could even add any number of hidden layers between the inputs and the outputs if you wanted to. 
The benefit of doing this is that now you can add nonlinear transformations known as activation functions between layers and this gives the overall model more flexibility to approximate complex datasets. One successful nonlinear transformation used between layers is the rectifying linear unit or ReLU for short and all it does is it zeroes out the negative values and only allows the positive values to pass through unchanged. And this is given by the equation ReLU of x equals the max of x and 0. And this can be thought of as the input only being considered active if its value is positive, and if it's negative, then it's inactive and has no effect. Now let's try adding this new feature to our graph. In TensorFlow, the weight multiplication and bias addition group is known as a dense layer. So I'll just replace this with a single dense layer operation, which gives us the hidden layer output and then we can feed this into another dense layer to get the logits. We can also add the activation function right after the hidden layer. Now to adjust our model, I'm going to change our single layer matrix multiplication into a function called dense that we can generalize to any input size and a given number of outputs. It can also accept an activation function to apply to the logits of the layer to get the output as the non-linear transformation of that layer if the activation function is given. We can then get our hidden layer by calling the dense function and specifying a certain number of outputs, let's say 30, and then we'll also pass in the ReLU activation function. So here the number of hidden inputs is a hyperparameter that we need to set and this could involve a bit of trial and error to get the best value. We can then link that layer to a second dense layer which outputs the logits. So now if we run this, we can see that our final accuracy improves from 92% to 96%. And we can add even more layers by passing the last hidden layer into another dense function call. Lastly, as a final note, you could use TensorFlow's built-in dense function in tf.layers.dense as well as the ReLU function in tf.nn.relu. Well, you just discovered how to classify images with a neural network, as well as a few upgrades that can make your model even more badass. Seriously, we've only scratched the surface of what you can do with a neural network. In my next video, I'm going to show you a completely different type of neural network which beats the multi-layered neural network for image classification. So make sure you're subscribed to get notified about that. Anyways, thanks so much for watching this video. If you liked it, do let me know via the like button. And until next time, keep learning like a machine. Bye!